This is Jamie Dyer welcoming you to another edition of The Quocast. And if you'd like to be a guest on a future episode of the podcast, you can. You can email quocast at outlook.com. That's quocast at outlook.com. You can tweet at the Quocast on Twitter or check out the Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash the Quocast. In this episode, I'm joined once again by John Coglan, who talks to me about his new project, John Coglan's Quo Reimagined, and much more. Thank you for being on the podcast again. It's been a couple of years since we spoke. I saw you on stage at the convention uh, in Butlins in Minehead, and oh, yeah. that was the last gig for, for John Coglan's Quo. Just sum up quickly how that felt kind of playing your last gig with jcq in front of basically a hard quo crowd yeah it was all right you know we uh, we um decided to call it a day there i know they're going out as a quo connection now but uh, uh it was okay well then you know i've been talking to paul jeffries a double bass player on this jazz thing that we're doing and uh, he said, why don't we do something together? And we rehearsed it. And we're, I've got some, you know, the quo tracks we're doing. And uh, it, it's worked out very well. So it's, it makes a nice change for me. Because you did your first one back in October at Burford Jazz, didn't you? Yeah, that was um, that was Warwick Hall. And that, that um, particular gig was sold out. Because I thought, you see, how this all started, Julie, my wife and me, we'd go to Warwick Hall once a month to see the jazz with Paul Jeffries playing bass. And it'd be all different lineups, saxophone, you know, keyboards, uh, guitar, acoustic guitar, clarinet, and all sorts of different things. And and uh, this thing I'm doing with, with Paul is um, called John Cogner's Quo Reimagined, Jazz Meets Pop. And so basically it's Alex Steele on keyboards Paul Jeffers on bass, me on drums, and Ben Holder on violin and vocals. How did you come to kind of reinvent those those tracks? Because obviously the, the tracks you did with Quo were kind of rock and blues. How did you go about converting them to jazz? Well, I think they uh, these guys are good players, and they just we just rehearsed, and they, they played me some arrangements. Then I added the drums to it, and it seemed to work very well. So... Um, majority of songs that, that I played on, there's only a couple of songs that we do in the set that I didn't play on the original tracks. You know, I can tell you about all that later, but um, it, it's worked over well. And what was happening at the Warwick Hall in Bertha was the fact that everyone was up, standing up at the end and cheering and wanted more. And I thought, well, that's the first time I've ever seen that happen at Warwick Hall in Bertha. So it was great. And um, Bob Young was there. Uh, it was Sue Young, his wife, and my wife there. And Bob Young said it was great. He loved it because Bob was our originally our roadie. Then he became tour manager in Quo. And, you know, if Bob was said, if Bob thought something was rubbish, he'd tell it was rubbish. But he loved it. He said it was great. And uh, we did Mean Girl because he, he co wrote that. And um, he loved this, the arrangement. But, um, yeah, it's a thing I think you need to come and see just to see what it's like. What do you think uh, a Quo fan would think if they came to, to see it? Well, I think they'd be quite surprised because. We we'll start, you know, I'm playing brushes instead of sticks, and um, it is quite different. But I, I must say, because it's um, been sort of modernised in jazz, or modernised is that the right word? Uh, it, you, you obviously still recognise the song. You know, we haven't, we haven't just totally destroyed the song and made it so different. You know, you know. I mean, example like uh, when we start, it's all right with me, a trio. That's it's Ben, Alex, and Paul. They introduce me and we do whatever you want. Mean Girl, Pictures of Matchstick Men. There's Rock and Love the World, uh, In the Army Now, and The Wanderer. And um, whatever you whatever you want as an encore. Yeah, and you know, it's it's, it's interesting. And I and I we're rehearsing again quite soon because we we're doing the, the Crooked Billet, which is uh, near Stoke Row, which is, well, is Stoke Row, and it's near Henley on Thames. But one, one I'd like to mention is we've been asked by some friends of the at Royal Air Force Brian's Norton, will we do a, a gig at the Whitney Lakes in Oxfordshire 
uh, and it's a nice venue, and um, it's for help for heroes. So all the money coming in, that would be help for heroes. That's March the 18th. Are you surprised at kind of the reaction to the jazz thing and that you're getting these bookings? Yeah, it is, um, you know, because uh, people don't know, they haven't heard it, so they're booking us anyway. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased about it all. And um, if I may take this chance to announce where the gigs are, the, the first one we're doing soon is the Crooked Billet, 8th of Feb, and that's Stoke Row uh, near Henley. The stables, 4th of March, which is um, Cleo Lane's place. And uh, I played there with um, JCQ many times, and that's Wavendon near Milton Keynes. The Whitney Lakes is Help for Heroes, 18th of March, and that's uh, near Whitney in Oxfordshire. Then there's a ball set in Barnes, 25th of March, Saturday, and uh, that's in London by the Thames. Corn Exchange, Whitney, 7th of April, that's, that's Oxfordshire. Half Moon Putney, 4th of June, and Warwick Hall, Burford, again on the 14th of July. So you have a choice. There's quite a lot of uh, of venues to choose from, as you say. Um, I feel like when we spoke before, you talked about how you've always kind of been interested in jazz. Well, it, it was. Um, I think it's gone back to the days when my parents used to take me with them to Crystal Palace Hotel. Uh, called the CPH, and we they'd have a big band on, you know, about to say big band, ten piece, twelve piece band, and there'd be ballroom dancing. And I used to sit down and watch watch the drummers, and it was very interesting because uh, it was the early days, you know, and uh, I wasn't even playing a, in a rock band or anything at that time, or a band at all. And uh, it, my dad bought lots of jazz records, Joe Loss. Uh, there's all sorts of different bands and stuff, and I'd learned all of that, and it was just—it's a thing I loved, and uh, just part of part of growing up. Do you think that um, a little bit of that jazz influence went into your playing with Quo? I always think so, especially with the shuffle. Yeah, yeah, the shuffle and um, stuff like that, because people like my shuffle. Because the funny thing is, um, when I watched all the drummers in my time, in my younger days. They're all right-handed and, um, you know, playing the bass drum with the right foot, high hat with the left foot, uh, right cymbal on the right-hand side. And so, but I'm actually left-handed, but I play right-handed and I learned to do the shuffle, you know, with both hands. We got in that in my chair, which is uh, one of the quotes songs. And uh, it paid off. So the accent, the accent is on the offbeat on the snare drum with a shuffle and it works very well. So I, I could, I was very good at it. And that's about another person who's extremely good at this shuffle was Mick Fleetwood or Fleetwood Mac, as you probably guessed, you know, excellent. Definitely. So you, you certainly went through quite a few styles with Quo. I mean, this year is the 45th anniversary of the, if you can't stand the heat album where you kind of experimented with different styles. I mean, accident prone, for example, you're basically playing a disco beat. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that was that was quite different. Uh, I can't remember how we got to that. I, I, did, did we have a producer? I can't remember thinking back that far. It was Pip Williams? Pip, that's right. Yeah, that, so it, it, it would have been Pip Williams um, getting me to play that style. So yeah, it was directed by Pip. Yeah, and it, I think it works. It's actually quite nice to play. You mentioned that there's a couple of songs in the set that you will be doing, which you didn't originally play on. Um, you mentioned The Wanderer, which, of course, yeah. came out in 83, 84. Um, what, what is the other one? That was, um, oh, In the Army Now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was, uh, that was chosen by a couple of the band, a couple of jazz musicians chose those songs because they liked those, and they thought, can we do it? I said, yeah, you know, it doesn't make any difference to me. And um, so, you know, um, you should come along to a gig and see what, see how we deal with it all. I'd love to, because um, when you listen to um, later Quo's version of, of In the Army Now, a lot of the stuff is, it, it, I could imagine you doing some of those, some of those fills and things. Really? Yeah, yeah. I haven't heard it for ages, for a long time. But I do mention seeing Francis at a gig some years ago, and I said to him, I like it, and he said... He said, thank you, Spud, that's great. But he, 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 I was probably the only person who actually liked the song. But he didn't, a lot of Quo fans didn't actually think it was a Quo song. They thought it was um, well, a good song, but someone else's, you know. But uh, they recorded it. And um, 
so you have it, you know, you uh, have it in the army now. Yeah. Um, these upcoming gigs that you've got um, with these musicians, as you mentioned, Alex Steele, uh, pianist and arranger, violinist uh, Ben Holder, and Paul Jeffries on bass. What's it like playing with almost a new set of musicians? Oh, it's great. It, it is good fun, you know, because it's uh, you're experimenting and testing each other. And it's really good, and uh, it worked. It worked very, very well. And just working with each other, you know, it's, it made a nice change for me. Really nice change. So I was pleased with it. Well, I'm sure there will be many people uh, that will look forward to to hearing it. I've had a few questions on the internet. I've seen people talking about these gigs, and I wasn't going to ask, but I kind of have to. Are you planning on recording any of of these gigs? Well, I did mention it to to the band when we were rehearsing, and uh, I said there is a little studio where the rehearsal places, and we could go in and record something. But I think what we might do, my idea would be to go in and record some stuff, and and get it get him pressed into CDs and we could probably sell the CDs at, at gigs. You know, it would be a good idea because I I'm certainly interested in hearing some of those songs in a slightly different arrangement. Um, you'll have to excuse my ignorance, but is there a certain part of um the jazz thing that is like improvised, or is it all kind of worked out? beforehand is there room for improvisation i know what you mean i know what you mean it's um basically it's a set it's it's worked out but it's yeah there is sort of a bit of imp- improvisation there but it's good fun because you can experiment with it and uh, not not changing it totally but just uh, doing a few drum fills the bass probably do a few fills and the keyboards and bend on the um, violin yeah you know it, it's um see which way you go and just um experiment with it and um but you, like i said earlier you know you you still would know what song it is we, we, we haven't changed it that bad so you know i say bad we haven't changed it that so much you wouldn't recognize it but we tend to keep me and paul would probably keep the uh, the rhythm staying as it is and um just the other two would um, improvise a bit probably yeah because uh it's worth pointing out there is um ben's also a singer isn't he yeah, he does good vocals as well, and he's he's a good front man. Outside of the jazz thing, what what are you doing with your time now? Well, there's also uh, previously before I I got to talk to you today is I was doing some pre-recording at Whitney Radio, which is a little radio station in Whitney, Oxfordshire, and uh, they got a, li- a very big listening base now, and uh, it's called John Cogner's Rock Heaven, and I play uh, with Graham, the producer, and we play. All, all my favourite rock stuff, like um, oh, there's a there's all sorts of stuff, and um, you know, Toto, um, mm-hmm. Africa, that, yeah, that's right, and lovely stuff, and Stevie Winwood and Spencer Davis Group and Led Zeppelin, and just stuff that I really enjoyed in my past and listening to, and we we put a show together, and I've also done one with Ray Jackson from Lindisfarne. Uh, he was a special guest with me and uh, you know it was just so nice to play stuff that you like and it's and also we were saying me and graham were saying about people of today kids of today have no idea about the rock business that we all had and there are some classic songs you know stuff that could never be the younger kids would never turn up with something better than you know uh, toto or something like that you know what i mean and uh, it was um, really interesting. It was lovely. Some of the stuff you you forget about. You know, oh, I haven't heard that for years, you know, and uh, that's how it hits you, and it's just lovely. So, yeah, I've done three programmes so far, and I think they're coming out February, March. I mean, you, you did a show before with BBC Oxford, didn't you, for a while? Yeah, five years, Jilly and me did that. But then we had Elkie Brooks, Noddy Holder, Bruce Walsh, and uh, people like we knew because we was twice a year, there's a thing called the Old Boys Lunch, and it started originally with Keith Altham, our, our um, publicist, would invite band members of certain bands that he worked with, and uh, we'd all meet for lunch in London. And all the people that I had at uh, at the studio, Linda Swan was another one. Uh, there was loads, loads of people. You know, Elkie Brooks, although she didn't come to the studio, she did it from Barnstable down in 
Devon, I believe that is. And Noddy Holder was great. He, he was in Manchester and he drove down. I said, look, there's not, there's not much money in it, Nod, but he'd take you to lunch. Yeah, next time we're going to the studio and do some record, um, recording. And we, we, it, the show was only an hour. We ended up talking for two hours. And the producer, Mark Watson, was so pleased. He said, I've got two shows out of it. All we were doing was, I mean, like, listen to this. I mean, in the 70s, we did a tour of Australia. There was um, Slade, Linda's Farm, Status Quo, and Caravan on one tour. We flew to Australia and we, we uh, toured Australia. And the funny thing was, each band had all a road crew, so it was a plane full of um, rock people. Internally, it was hilarious because the, the, we found out they were putting detectives on the plane, thinking, you know, there's a lot of English musos, as they called us, are going to be writers on the plane. But we, we knew who they were. We, everyone behaved themselves impeccably. It was wonderful. We they, they, and we saw that the last flight, when we were getting off the plane, we say, bye, guys, see ya. You know, they hadn't arrested anybody because we were well behaved. <laughs> Which would have surprised them. Yeah, because also that's the that situations like that. When the, when I spoke to um, Ray Jackson, Linda Swan, we were talking about that. And also Noddy Holder when I was doing the Oxford thing. But, the, you know, the BBC decided after about four or five years, do I know any young singers? Now, I'm 76 at this moment in time. I think I probably... 74 than the other one or 75 something like that and i said i don't know anybody any young singers i'm you know i'm too old and and i had visions of um, ed sheeran being on the show and i i know nothing about ed he would know nothing about so to so what i'm thinking is we have nothing to talk about i think that's quite a common theme at the moment certainly in bbc radio where they're changing their demographics somewhat oh yeah you know and i think I remember there's a, a, a dear old friend of mine who's moved away from Oxford now. He was a jazz drummer and he was really good. And uh, he's told me recently there was a program he used to listen to on the radio. I'm not sure what radio station it was, but uh, obviously BBC. And this woman turned up to that. Oh, I don't think there's enough for people listening to that and took it off the air. I and mean, I think that's rather silly because I think there were lots of you know, like-minded older people that love jazz and would just love listening to it, to take it away because she doesn't think it was right. Is I think totally ignorant, totally wrong. So John Coughlin's Quo Reimagined is at the Crooked Billet on the 8th of February. Further details can be found on the John Coughlin Facebook page and also johncoughlin.com. Good luck with it, John. It's it's such an interesting thing. And do you expect many Quo fans to come along? Or do you think it's mainly going to be a jazz audience? Well, no, I think it'd be, uh, being honest with you, I think it'd be a mixture. Um, obviously, but there's bound to be a few that don't like it. Or, found, or it's not up, not up their street. So, you know, you can't please all the people all the time. But I, I just wish we could. But I'm sure there'd be want to come along see me play and think well we, you know we can take it there there was a lovely lots of people love what I, I did when it was in Burford at Warwick Hall so yeah it'd be it'd be nice just it'd be lovely to see people turn up and, and appreciate what we're doing I'm sure they will because like you say if Bob Young says it's great then it's great <laughs> yes that's right well Bob never messes about he's always straight so you know he would he would tell me you know, if it if it wasn't very good then he would would have said so but uh, yeah you know it, it, it is good. Thank you, John, for being on the podcast today. Oh, uh, it's fine, mate. No problem. Any time. Thank you. 